Hi, I'm Jeff Pierce, and I discovered another video which I just feel compelled to respond to, even though it's been up for a while, I just found it, um, and it's still out there making people ignorant and stupid about Ethiopian history, and this has to be, this has to be addressed. Um, let's go through it, point by point. Members of the powerful Amhara tribe Selassie's family claimed they could trace their roots all the way back to Emperor Menelik I. Okay, three things. First of all, you say that Haile Selassie came from the powerful Amhara tribe. Well, Haile Selassie had mixed heritage. He had both Amhara and Oromo roots. Second, stop saying Selassie. It's Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie is the throne name that was used. He was born to Fari Makonnen. His father was Ras Makonnen. When you just say Selassie, it's nonsensical. It's like calling Barack Obama Obam. So stop doing it. Three, stop using the term tribe because it's a white construct. It's outdated. It's borderline racist, if not outright racist. <laughs> um, it's ridiculous. You don't refer to the Irish as a tribe. You don't refer to the Welsh as a tribe. You've got a lower population in Iceland than you have millions of Igbo in Nigeria. I don't hear you calling the Icelanders a tribe, so knock that off. Ethiopia has ethnic peoples. Nigeria has ethnic peoples. And Selassie led the charge in accusing Yasu of being an apostate, a traitor, and generally just a giant douchebag. No, he didn't. And the fact that you phrase it that way, Selassie led the charge, shows how sloppy your research is and how lazy your writing is. The conspiracy to oust Iyasu actually came from Shoan aristocrats and church officials. Yes, Haile Selassie was happy to be their hand-picked successor, but he wasn't in on the planning at the formative stages. What's more, the real takeaway that you miss is the fact that the British ambassador was on board with this and ready to help, and so were other diplomatic personnel in Ethiopia. The British were doing all kinds of sleazy tricks behind the scenes to try to help get rid of Iyasu. Okay, so how do I know about the British ambassador doing this? Because you can find all their dirty communications right in the documents of the National Archives and Q Richmond in England. You can take a train out there and go through them, but I guess it didn't occur to you guys to go check any primary sources. Although the European press, including the novelist Evelyn Waugh, ridiculed it, this is more of an observation than a criticism, but I really want to know why is it that whenever you guys talk about the early Haile Selassie period in Ethiopia, you go back to Evelyn Waugh. Do you guys ever bother to read his books or look at his work? Okay, yeah, he wrote Scoop, which is considered a classic by some. He also wrote Black Mischief, which is an incredibly racist novel. Um, I have a first edition of Brideshead Revisited, fine. But the thing is, this is a guy who wrote propaganda for the Daily Mail, promoting fascism and Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. Why do you guys reference him at all? And why don't you ever mention this in terms of your background? Opening on October the 2nd, 1935, the Italo-Ethiopian War was short, it was grim, and it was humiliating. Okay, first of all, the war did not start on October 2nd. Yes, Mussolini made a speech to stoke the war fever on October 2nd, but the actual war started on October 3rd, when three columns of the Italian army crossed the Marab River, and when the Italian planes started to bomb Adwa. So get the small details right. Second of all, you go short, grim, and humiliating. Humiliating for whom? These people were defending their country. You can say short and you can say grim because, yes, it lasted roughly about half a year, give or take, but I defy that description of humiliating. You had incredible heroism uh, showcased by the Ethiopian soldiers against horrible odds and conditions. You had Ras Imru, who made incursions into Italian territory guerrilla style. Uh, why don't you talk about that? In the face of such dirty tactics, 
What hope did the Ethiopians have? On May 2, 1936, Haile Selassie boarded his imperial train and was taken away into exile. Three days later, Addis Ababa fell. And I noticed that you go right to Haile Selassie's exile without mentioning that this man manned an anti-aircraft gun in Orlikon uh, to fight planes and also led the final army uh, against the Italians. Yes, it was beaten. He was forced into retreat back to Addis Ababa. But what about that? As one correspondent observed, this isn't a war. It isn't even a slaughter. It's the torture of tens of thousands of men, women, and children with bombs and poison gas. You said that this was written by a correspondent. No, it wasn't. It was written by John Milley, a British doctor who went over to help the Ethiopians. And how do I know this? Because I own the actual book where these lines are taken from. As Ethiopia crumbled, some of the Italian commanders suggested that they bomb Selassie's train, but Mussolini demurred. You say some commanders. It wasn't some commanders. It was Rodolfo Graziani, the so-called butcher of Fezzan, the guy who had been gassing the Ethiopians again and again. He's the one who got overruled by Mussolini and told not to bomb Haile Selassie's train. With a victory so complete, the fascist leader could afford to be magnanimous. What is this nonsense about victory so complete? Did you guys read even a single book? There were Arbenoch patriots taking to the hills and mountains on the very day that the Italians were coming into Addis Ababa and making sniper attacks down from the hills on Italian soldiers. You had people joining the resistance, both men and women. In response, Winston Churchill called Selassie out of retirement, gave him the codename Mr. Strong, and flew him secretly to Khartoum with a simple goal. Train up an army of resistance, invade Italy's colonies, and kick Mussolini out on his pudgy ass. It was a plan the King of Kings would carry out with extreme prejudice. Where did you get this rubbish? The Emperor had nothing to do with the day-to-day -day logistical planning of the liberation. That was done by British officers. They were supervising the effort. And the soldiers who were doing the job were often colonial soldiers from British imperial possessions. There were soldiers from India, there were soldiers from Nigeria, there were soldiers from the Gold Coast. You also had the Ethiopian Arbenoch, you had the Ethiopian Resistance. You know, yeah, Haile Selassie was there, but he did not lead this in any way. He was there to gather, to inspire support, and to eventually be put back on the throne. Not long after, Selassie finally did what international supporters had been hoping he'd do for years. He fully abolished slavery. A long-standing form of punishment, slavery had been so entrenched in the nation that even nominally anti-slavery emperors like Melanic II had owned hundreds of slaves. Even Selassie himself is thought to have been a slave owner. Except he wasn't. You say, is thought. Thought by who? Where's your historical evidence for this? I love how this subject is covered lately because it's just laced with passive-aggressive revisionism and just nonsense. Throughout the centuries of Ethiopian history, by and large, the slave trade, much of it was an export trade to the Middle East and to India. Why is there no mention of that when recounting this? Why don't you balance uh, the account by mentioning the Edict of Galadeus? Uh, his edict was an anti-slavery edict, which goes all the way back to the 1500s. It, it goes further back than, say, the British Empire abolishing the slave trade in 1807. And you know something? There's a very interesting difference. Galadeus basically said, okay, when you bring slaves here, I want an accounting. I want to know each and every one that you've got. Uh, you've got to produce the paperwork. So in other words, there was a law and order infrastructure to, to manage this. What's more, uh, if you were found <laughs> that you didn't have the proper paperwork, they could confiscate your property. They could put you to death. Now, let's look at the British abolishment of the slave trade. They compensated slave traders. <laughs> and that ran into the millions right into our modern era. So tell me, who is more, who has the moral high ground in this? Oh, and just a little bit of trivia for you while you're busy bashing the country's historical record on slavery. You know who else had slavery 
in Ethiopia, the fascist Italians, they made a big deal when they took over the country to say, oh, we're abolishing slavery. And then when the liberation campaign by the Brits and the Ethiopian Arbanoch were winning, they brought slavery back. So why don't you ever mention that? Today, it's unknown exactly how many died in the Wale famine, although estimates place it as around 200,000 people. The famine was not just in Wallo. I realize that a lot of the footage that you can find online on YouTube of the old documentary by Jonathan Dimbleby that shows Wallow, but the famine was also striking hard in Tigray. In fact, the famine and drought situation was urgent across a wide belt of Africa. But the real problem was Selassie's reaction. Rather than beg the international community for help, the emperor tried to hide what was happening, even throwing sumptuous banquets to cover up the food scarcity. Well, this is bullshit. Also, what is it with this sneering condescension? Rather than beg the international community to help, why should he have to beg at all? And no, he did not hide what was happening. There is ample evidence to show that court officials and ministers kept the worst of what was happening from the emperor. Yes, the buck should stop with him, but this is an elderly man, and yes, this is one of his failings that he was out of touch. So you can put that at his doorstep, to, but to portray him as being the person who tried to cover it up is amounts to slander. I know where you probably got from. You probably got it from Alex Mango de Wall, who was an official with Africa Watch, which was part of Human Rights Watch, and he goes out of his way to write this mendacious report about the famine because he had already started to become a propagandist for the TPLF. Now, uh, if you want to lay the famine at the doorstep of Ethiopian officials, yes, you can. The ministries represented here must take much of the blame for the deaths from starvation last year. Ministers like Malati Dubebe did nothing for too long. When they finally sought help, they asked too quietly for too little, and it was too late. But you know who was helping them to cover it up? Western aid organizations. Here is The Politics of Starvation by Jack Shepard. And he implicates UNICEF, the U.S. Development Program, the World Food Program, U.S. Aid, the U.S. Peace Corps, were all helping to ship aid in, but on the understanding that the government could keep the disaster under wraps. There is even a U.S. Embassy official who said there was a conspiracy of silence all along the line. So why don't we ever implicate these Western aid organizations in this? Why is the blame just put totally at the feet of the Ethiopians? As when the emperor was alive, there exist two Haile Selassies. One is the Selassie of Rasta thought, a black spiritual leader that a million people worship and millions more have heard about. Whistler and his team dwell on Rastafarianism. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but not once throughout this video is there a mention that Haile Selassie never accepted their idea that he was a god. He was a devout member of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It was kind of... Uh, disconcerting to have these people worship him as a god and he denied this in public every chance he got after denouncing selassie as a coward garvey changed his mind and started making ethiopia a focal point of his back to africa movement this section on marcus garvey is a complete mess especially its chronology marcus garvey practically worshipped Haile Selassie in the 1930s and wrote effusive editorials about him for his newspaper, The Black Man. When the emperor went into exile, he condemned him as a traitor. He did not change his mind. The focus of Back to Africa did not change to Ethiopia under Garvey because the Back to Africa campaign was in the 1920s. And in 1940, which was when Marcus Garvey died as a result of strokes, Ethiopia was still under the occupation of the fascist Italian government, so this is nonsense. On August the 27th, 1975, the Derg tersely announced that Selassie had died of natural causes. No, they weren't told that at all. They were told that he died due to complications from a prostate operation. Just a man, and one who, sadly, ended his reign not beloved, but driven from power. You know, there are lots of fun, entertaining videos about history out there on YouTube. Uh, some are even educational, but this is not one of them. 
Um, this is a hideous product, which clearly demonstrates that these guys didn't care enough about the subject to do the most basic research and homework. If you're of Ethiopian descent, um, I'm willing to bet many of you are appalled and feel insulted by the sloppiness of this thing. Um, you could have gone to a general public library and crack some books to check the most basic facts, but it's clear you couldn't even be bothered to do that. I, it's coming up on something like 20 years since I st first started to uh, look into Ethiopian history and cover this subject. They're a courageous, endlessly fascinating people and culture, and they deserve far better than this. Uh, but you... You guys just wanted to crank out a product and do a subject matter, and you thought you'd skate by with this pompous delivery and a few photo, still photos and maybe some footage, and you could say what you like. And it's this kind of bullshit that helps fuel ethnic uh, conflict. Uh, in another video, you idiots claim that the Derg were Amhara. Uh, the Derg murdered about 60 aristocrats and officials. Who do you think they were killing? And even then, they were all about class and Marxism. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. It just so happened that they wanted to murder those in power. It's this kind of crap that you do, where you go around saying that the emperor uh, was trying to cover up the famine, when there's ample evidence that he was in the dark as to conditions of the famine, and learned about it later. Um, when you go around making this nonsense that he was the person who was the chief architect of the uh, ousting of Iyasu, it's just, it's just lazy as hell. You guys should be kept away from sharp objects such as forks and computer terminals. I'd warn you away from books, but I don't think you ever pick any up.